Hello, everyone. Welcome back. And also welcome to the people that are joining us online. We are at the Heinrich Paul Foundation in Berlin. And this is the third keynote of our central banking conference. I'm really excited about this. Um, Daniela Gabor will present collateral factories and the risk in states. And I'm really thrilled to introduce Daniela. She's professor of economics and macrofinance at the University of West of England in Bristol. And I'm sure you are all uh, aware of who she is and read her work, which is absolutely essential for all of us working on, on these topics. She made amazing contributions in pretty much everything that she has written about. Um, but enough about that. I mean, you, you don't want to hear me speaking about Daniela, but you want to hear Daniela herself. So I leave the floor to her. Thank you. I'll try with the mask on, just to be consistent with my principles and to avoid uh, the fate of my last journey to Heinrich Ball Foundation, uh, which was a bit more exciting, I hope, than this time. So let me start by thanking Pavlos in particular for choosing a title for my presentation. It was called initially The State as a Collateral Factory. He made an excellent choice, given that I uh, didn't answer his emails on time, so he decided for me, thank you. It also intimated to some kind of class analysis in my uh, presentation from the fact that there is a factor in there. I'm afraid I will disappoint you, but maybe not entirely. I have changed it a little bit, so I can introduce to you my, one of my latest uh, an interest, which is, uh-oh, down, yes, down. I thought you all know what the collateral factories are, so maybe I should start in a more surprising way. Can I ask for a show of hands how many people have seen this? Yeah. Oh, this is much better than I ex expected. <laughs> okay, guys, this is not uh, uh, inviting your opinions on Stranger Things. Thank you, Clement. <laughs> but it is to say that uh, I think Stranger Things is a very interesting show for a variety of reasons. And if I was to summarize it very quickly and very crudely, Stranger Things is about a small town in the United States um, called Haw Hawthorne, where uh, all of a sudden this small town in, in the US finds itself confronted with a parallel supernatural world called the Upside Down, right? And you can see it, let me see. Apparently I can give you some light. This is the Upside Down world that looks a lot like the small town, except that it's lifeless and dark. And there are monsters lurking around. And we find out in the first season, which Clement is right, was much better than the last season. <laughs> we find out in the first season that the main character of the series, and I will have no debate whether she's the main character or not, she is. Oh, the main character of the, of the, of the series, a girl with superpowers called Eleven, She's the one who can open gates between the upside down and the, the, the normal real world. Of course, she gets superpowers because she was kidnapped by the American military who did experiments with her, uh, very much in the tradition of this kind of uh, uh, movies. So Eleven is the one who opens up channels communications be of communication between upside down and the, and the real world. And the other character is called Will. Will doesn't have superpowers. He comes from a problematic family in some ways, or at least he's depicted like that in the beginning. But he's very sensitive to what happens in the upside down. He, under, he knows when the upside down sort of starts to prepare to uh, invade or to try to take over the, small, the, the little town. There is also a cast of characters that is helping uh, Eleven and Will in trying to fight, of course, the monsters. There are the monsters, and as we go through the seasons, these monsters become increasingly complex, increasingly powerful, and increasingly difficult to fight. And of course, the only one that has the superpowers to be able to fight back the Demagorgons, the, 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 the Mind Flayer, and Vecna, see, I still remember their names, is Eleven, because she has uh, superpowers, right? And of course, there, is, there are Russians in the story, because it's an, a US series. <laughs> And the Russians kind of sit around until the last season, and they just kind of benefit from the fight between the US military, the, small, the kids in the small town, and the monsters in uh, Upside Down. 
okay? And there are many reasons why this has become a pop cultural phenomenon, not only because it's on Netflix and we were all bored during the last several years of the pandemic, not only because if you were born like me in the late 1970s, this is a show that reminds you of your childhood because it has very nice music, it has the atmosphere of the 1980s, so it plays with our nostalgia. But also I think it has been very interesting, and many people have read it, as an account of how capitalism changes social relationships. The capitalism that is happening in the upside down is changing and devouring all forms of capitalism in the normal, regular world. And I think this is an interesting metaphor, so what I'm going to try to do today is to tell you a story of the European crisis and a story of stranger European things. <laughs> Let's see if I can do this, if I can find out which button to press. So, when we think about Europe, especially these days, Europe has many interesting things happening, like in the little town in the United States, but we know that things are going really wrong in Europe when we see spikes in the interest rates or the yields that um, European governments pay above Germany, right? So every time you have a spike here, there is a worry that something is happening. And usually these points of crisis are narrated as either finally the market is repricing the debt of the European states in the periphery that should be paying a lot more than they are. There are the, another way of telling this story is, well, you know, too much fiscal expansion uh, or too little structural adjustment or structural transformation, too little appetite for reform. Or in the most sort of common narrative is there are speculative forces somewhere hanging out in European monetary uh, spaces, and these speculative forces drive up and down these yields and what to do, we sometimes have to respond to them. And the story that I've been telling with my research over the last, I would say, seven to eight years, is that there is an upside down, and I'm sure most of you will recognize this, this is uh, Zoltan Poshar's famous story of a uh, famous map of the shadow banking world that we saw in 2011. And since then, uh, I started, stopped writing about Eastern Europe and started writing about uh, shadow banking because it's, it's quite fascinating. And for Europe, we can think about this upside down or shadow banking as the plumbing of the financial system in Europe, the place where a lot of social relationships are changing, but in very complex ways that we do not keep very easily track of, particularly because we ignore this part of the upside down, which is the European repo market. And the European repo market is a, mar is a very large market. I'm showing you, you here, it's around 10 trillion euros outstanding in 2021. This is as large as the, government, as the German and French government bond markets put together in outstanding terms. And this is the market that circulates European sovereign bonds and creates or amplifies moments of tension or speculative, speculative positions. So if we think about this metaphor of stranger things, I thought who would be the characters, right? Because this is the interesting part. Who, does the, who plays the role first of 11? And I came up, at least Pavlos should recognize this one. Uh, I came up with 11 in the, in the early se first season. So remember, 11 is the one that is, does the conduit between the upside down and the real world. This is Alberto Giovannini. Yes, Alberto Giovannini is probably the most powerful Italian you've never heard of. And I could tell the story of stranger European things as the story of Italians doing things in European financial markets. Uh, but it would be a bit boring because they're all men. So I'll try, I'll try not to do that. But Alberto Giovannini, was the, f one of, was the father or the architect of the creation of the European repo market for government bond markets in Europe, first in his role at the Italian Treasury, and then in his role in various uh, technocratic elite spaces in the Euro area, including he drove forward the process of creating the, the European Directive on Collateral. The uh, Will in this story, and remember Will, is the guy without superpowers, but who's very sensitive to what's happening in the uh, underworld, is Mario Draghi, 
in his sad moment when he represents the Italian government bond market, right? The Italian government bond market is the place that we sense that something is wrong or moves uh, uh, in the European financial system that creates problems for the rest of, of Europe. And then those problems can be easily solved or solved in, in some ways by the, a new incarnation of 11, which is Mario Draghi smiling. When, he, <laughs> when he's in charge of the European Central Bank. Right? So when it, uh, Mario Draghi jumps from Minister of Finance into, or head of the Treasury to head of the European Central Bank, then he has the powers to, to fight back the destructive forces of the European financial system that can create particular types of problems for the European fiscal authorities, and from there can unleash a lot of changes in social relationships when we think ab about the fact that the fiscal authority is one of the most important guardians of the relationship between citizens and the European state and the social contract between citizens and the European state. Uh, Mario Draghi, of course, had to make way for others. So we have a, a French woman in this story, uh, very important, who are the, the, very type, the many types of monsters lurking in the underworld of the European financial system. I just put one of them there to make about to Ben Brown's work on asset management. This is um, Larry Fink, the head of BlackRock, who is moving lots of things around and lots of money around. And, He's managing a balance sheet the size of the European repo market, which is quite fascinating in many ways in terms of the order of magnitude and in terms of the questions of political power that arise from there. But also, market-based banks in Europe and uh, elsewhere are quite important in the ways that they are now very intricately embedded in uh, the underworld and quite responsible for uh, some of the dynamics that are happening there. And of course, now this leaves me with a question of who are the Russians? And the Russians are the Russians in other stories, but in our story, the Russians are, I saw the Germans. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is also a pun for what is happening in Germany now. But the, the, Rus the, the Germans in this story, they benefit in many ways, and I'll tell you in a second in more detail, they benefit from the, real, the particular types of disturbances that are generated in the European repo market, because every time something goes wrong for the European financial system or for the European sovereigns, Germany benefits. This is why I showed you at the beginning the spread to the German Bund. Germany does well out of a crisis in the uh, upside down. I'm not talking about energy crisis, it's a very different story. I'm telling you the story of the uh, European macrofinancial system. So, how do we make sense of this story very quickly? I think there is a, and I want to use this story to, to, to sort of make an argument that we don't have to think of, of the state only as a factory, a collateral factory, as a force that is feeding the upside down for reasons that have to do with the political economy of the Eurozone area, but we have to, this op offers up an opening to think about the changing nature of governance and the changing nature of the state, not only in the Euro area, but elsewhere. And I want to tell you a story uh, that draws on the critical macrofinance perspective, and there are two angles to this critical macrofinance. One that Katarina also alluded to yesterday, which is kind of obvious in some ways, is that private finance and the macro institutions of the state evolve together and adjust to each other or feed, feed institutional changes into uh, each other. And this, this is a tradition that goes back to Hyman Minsky. I and several others have worked in it. Adam Tuzzi's uh, latest book is written explicitly with this uh, angle. Um, but there is, besides this aspect of simply treating or paying analytical attention to this um, uh, codependency or coevolution, there is a critical angle there in the sense that there, this coevolution is marked by political struggle. It, it reflects particular changes in political and social interest, in social blocks, if you want. And I put there a lot of uh, uh, people who are researching this. Because also, uh, you will see, I want to propose that we can have a season's approach to European stranger things. And some of you have already uh, contributed to some of the scenarios or the scripts of every season. But I think the, the, the serious point to take here is that we live in financial capitalism. We live in a world that could be described, I described it as the upside down. 
that generates particular forms and dynamics of institutional transformation that we need to pay attention to, because these changes rearrange economic and political power by, finance, by configuring who gets financing and who doesn't. And I'll tell you a bit more about that in a second. But there are three, there are four pillars or three, however, I've, I've shrunk uh, a couple of them into one. Uh, one is that we live in US-led financial globalization and we don't see a stronger evidence of that than today. And I'll show you in a second why today is a special day for Europe. Uh, I'm not sure everybody applauds it, but it's a special uh, day today. Uh, we live in the age of US-led financial globalization and we've had a massive structural shift towards market-based finance or towards, uh, that came with a glut of institutional capital. And I can explain what that means in more practice, but it basically means that the upside down with this complicated plumbing that generates crisis up in the real world, it's not only a US or European phenomenon, but it's spreading everywhere. It's spreading everywhere through a variety of uh, forces and, and phenomena. And for example, the liquidity and sustainability faci facility proposal of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa is a proposal that, that really aims at bringing this kind of dynamics to countries in the African continent with the same promise of, you, I'll show you in a second, of uh, uh, better liquidity. And this is the, the punchline in the sense of this presentation. I have no idea how much time I have left, so you will have to stop me at some point because uh, I'm probably halfway through only. Uh, all behind why this matters is that behind the macroeconomic architecture that we have, and we don't, we dis I would describe it as a status quo architecture in the sense that it's the same one we had 40 years ago, which is the central banks are in charge. They do inflation targeting one way or another. And the fiscal authorities are subordinated to that. And that's how we tell the story of the macro architecture we have. What, what we have seen is an emergence of a de-risking state. And this de-risking state does things to stabilize both new types of money and credit that are created by the forces that are operating in this upside down. And it also helps the creation of new types of asset classes. And I'll show you in a second what I mean by this. They include housing, nature, and, and green spaces. And in a sense, this is why the upside down or the stranger things captures very well the, the, the structural phenomena at play here. Because remember, the logic of the upside down is that it tries to invade and take over our real, very small American town with its nice, uh, fine, happy kids. So what is the risking? Very briefly, uh, the risking is, comes from the recognition of the uh, fact that against neoliberalism, we live in an age of market failure. And market failure is, is defined very precisely to mean that we have wrong risk return profiles on both systemic assets like government bonds and on new types of asset classes or on new projects like green projects. And this market failure means that there are the returns are, are too low compared to risks or risks are too high compared to returns. And that means they are not, they are not generating the kind of inv private investment or the kind of financial stability that is necessary for our financial system and our economy to, for example, decarbonize or to grow or, or whatever. And with this growing importance of the, of, of the new concept of de-risking, uh, we have a change in the logic of state intervention or in the logic of state operation that I have called the de-risking state. And that means the state is increasingly urged to develop institutional vehicles and mechanisms to change risk return profiles in a, varieties of way, in a variety of ways. And you can think about it as a form of redistribution that takes moves risk from private balance sheets onto the state so that it, gener it can achieve a certain public uh, goals or public ambitions without changing the existing macrofinancial order. Nothing changes in the macrofinancial status quo, just the state makes it easier for capital to go wherever it would like to go, but it doesn't want to do it on its own. So with this in mind, I want to propose you at least four seasons of the, the, risky, of the Euro stranger European things. See, in season one, is the, like the, the world building season, right? That's where we find out what is happening and who, who does what. And that's a season where the state becomes a collateral factory. This is, uh, again, thank you, Pavlos. 
for, for the title, uh, and the state, becomes a, 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 the state becomes a collateral factor under the changing logic of the relationship between the central bank and the financial authorities in the 1980s and 1990s, and it creates exorbitant, the exorbitant bond, bond privilege. In season two, we get monetary de-risking. And I will say a bit more about this. The de-risking state has many ways in which it, in, in, it, with which it can intervene to change risk return profiles. The first one that matters and becomes normalized is monetary de-risking, which is at some point the central bank will say and has said, well, we have to intervene in government bond markets because risk return profiles are out of sync and they can destroy the financial stability and they can ch change the effectiveness of our transmission mechanism. The entire logic of intervention of the European Central Bank in government bond markets since 2008 is a logic of de-risking. And I will convince you about that in a second. In season three, this is the season when in Stranger Things, now I'm, so, I'm stressed because Clement has uh, watched them much closely than, than I have. But I, if I remember correctly, in three, season three, the monster goes really everywhere and he starts controlling the minds of the um, uh, citizens and inhabitants of this little town. And in our season three, the de-risking state goes beyond monetary de-risking and starts to do fiscal and regulatory de-risking under the promise or under the assumption that the state cannot directly change anything it cannot, because it cannot spend, cannot do public investment. So what it will do instead is to mobilize, catalyze private finance to create the de-risking partnerships. And of course, in season four, we are in it now. The inflation monster comes and complicates everything. So very quickly, well, are you keeping time? As in, how much time have I left? Uh, ah, good. OK, then we can go slower. <laughs> I can breathe a bit. So in season one and two, we have the emergence of the state as a collateral factory, that is a state that provides the modern financial system with its lifeblood, with the most important type of financial asset for then expanding balance sheets. And I have told this story in the 1990s as a story of, in Europe at least, as a story of competition between the French and the German uh, authorities or governments, including the central banks in the story, to, for who will become the European collateral factory of last resort. In other words, when things go wrong, where would financial institutions run to? And for a long time, the French hoped it would be the French government debt, not the Bund, that would receive these benefits, and did a lot of work in order to try to attract or to set up an upside down that looked a lot like the uh, US uh, repo market. And it's just not, it, it isn't just me, Ben Lemoine is also working on it and doing some really interesting work on the French treasury. Uh, by two, the 2000s, once the euro is created, the European Central Bank, uh, in a sense, sanctions the privilege that the Bund or the, the, the special uh, status that the Bund has and the German sta state has as a collateral factory, First, by inadvertently, so I, I wouldn't say that it is a deliberate policy. Sometimes we have to remember in these stories things happen, happen without the state really intending it. So the ECB, in a naive, nice fashion, said, well, you know, we should treat all collateral factories like the same collateral factory because this is Europe. And to do that, every time the, the, the European, any member state sends me it's collateral, I would treat it the same. So if the Greek collateral factory works for me, the same as the German collateral factory, no reasons to discriminate between them. Then of course, the Dutchman said that this is wrong. We in the Netherlands have never done anything uh, to, to, to change or, or subvert European rules. And therefore the ECB should not sanction fiscal indiscipline. And this has always been at the core of debates in, in the European monetary system that the relationship between the real world and the upside down in Europe, it's always a conflict between the monetary and the fiscal authority, a conflict that the fiscal authority usually, I'm afraid to say, loses, except for Germany. And we know <clears throat> that the ECB, in a sense, did not notice that the uh, Bund was becoming the safe asset of last resort for Europe or the safe asset for the European financial system, uh, when in 2005, it, it, it decided against intervening to try to push back against speculators that were, were engaging in breakup trades. In other words, what has happened since 2008, European government bond markets is not, is not 
knew it had happened before. The ECB was warned in the Financial Times before that it had to intervene directly. It had to buy gov Greek government bonds, sell German bonds in order to make sure that clever people working in finance were not taking advantage of the institutional pathologies and dysfunctionalities of the European monetary space. And the ECB decided to do nothing, uh, or not, not something very significant, because it was afraid, precisely, of the charge that it was monetizing government debt. It was monetizing deficits, and of course, uh, this is not, part of the, is not allowed in the European treaties. And then I think the most important part in the story of monetary risking comes after 2008, when what we had in Europe is a move or a crisis that starts in the, in the US moving into the European repo market for a variety of reasons that had to do with positions of European and other uh, shadow banks. And the ECB under Trichet refused to do anything significant about it until of course, our, the wheel of our story, or the Italian government bond market, came under so much pressure that the ECB had to recognize that the lender of last resort for Europe, for the euro area, is not functional as a backstop. This is quite fundamental, and I think if you read very carefully between the lines of some of the work that the ECB has done, they will accept that it's procyclical. Because it uses, and I've, I don't want to bore you with the details, but it uses the same mechanisms for pricing collateral that create destabilizing liquidity spirals. And finally, against Bundesbank opposition to the market maker of last resort, in September 2012, Draghi goes and says, I will save. He, he takes on the 11 hat, and he says, I will fight back against the upside down. And he didn't have to do anything. This is, the, this is how there is a, almost like a supernatural power, right? You just go and say, I will do whatever it takes, and then the, the disaster stops. And then he doesn't have to uh, do literally anything. But you will see, because this is a story of the upside down and the monsters becoming increasingly powerful, whatever it takes is not enough anymore. So that we have now variations of, of whatever it takes. And these are called closing the spread. And the latest uh, iteration is a transmission mechanism protection which again is a framing of the risking. It says, I don't intervene to help any government. I will think of ways in which to, cheat, to, to basically mislead or to satisfy the Germans and the Dutch that this is not helping governments, just to make sure that I have to protect my collateral factories from the pressures of the European repo market, from the pressures of the upside down. And I've wrote, wrote about this, the idea that not all uh, monetary financing is the same. In a 2021 report, and I just put it here, not because I wanted to uh, be as self-referential as I already am on, on my slides, but because it is the Heinrich Ball Foundation that published it, so I wanted to say thank you in the house here for this. A bit of the story of what I just told you is in there. So, we are in season three, and in season three, this move, this normalization of the risking interventions that was allowed by the fact that the state became a collateral factory and then had the, the circumstances push the central bank into uh, monetary de-risking, this now becomes a more normalized and more extensive uh, intervention in risk return profiles along a, 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 a broader range of fi financial assets. And I thought I, sh I would tell you just to convince you, because sometimes people say, well, what is this word risking? Where do you, did you get it from? I think this one was the first time when I met, inter, uh, got it, or I met it, and this is from the president of the World Bank Group, who said we have to start by asking routinely whether private capital, rather than government funding or donor aid, can finance a project. If the conditions are not right for private investment, we need to work with our partners to de-risk projects, to de-risk sectors, and to de-risk entire countries. Uh, I mean, this quote could have been written by Sven Gold and could have been pronounced here, looking at you. It kind of has the same logic of uh, green um, order liberalism. It's the same language that we saw in the GFANS, um, uh, the, the Carney-led financial coalition that is promising to bring trillions of US dollars into climate investment. It's, the, it's a story of de-risking. It's the same logic of the US government post-Trump 
that has gone from being a climate denier to being starting to build the foundations for uh, a de-risking uh, de state. And this is John Kerry saying, in order to get investment in uh, tr the climate transition or in decarbonization, you have to blend the finance, that is put pri private and public finance together, de-risk the investment, and create the capacity to have bankable deals. Okay, exactly the logic of de-risking that I've described to you at the, be at the beginning. And he lists a set of sectors where this should be done, of course. Um, and what I found even more interesting is that the same language of de-risking is present in the IPCC report on the, the latest one, uh, which has been hailed by many, and I think for the right reasons, as one of the most progressive IPCC reports. But when it comes to telling the story of, of macrofinance solutions for decarbonization, it is a story of the de-risking state. And I wanted to show you how the, the market-based finance and the upside down of the shadow banking world is starting to infiltrate many areas of the public provision or of the contract between citizens and, and the state. And this is an example from housing as an asset class out of a report that I've done with Sebastian Kohl from well, Berlin, I don't know where he is now, he's somewhere here in Berlin at the university, where we describe three types of the risking interventions that have made it easier for institutional investors or institutional capital to become your landlord and if you're living in Berlin, decrease your heating by some amount of degrees uh, this winter. And this includes regular, regulatory de-risking that, uh, that is guided by the logic not to regulate the sector better for public outcomes. It is guided by the logic of what regulatory changes do I need to put in place in order to make sure that Blackstone buys some more flats in Berlin. This is the, the basic logic of it. And I've listed here, and I don't want to bore you, but we can discuss it in the, in the question and answer time, the EU, EU social taxonomy, the solvency to regime for pension funds, the alternative investment fund uh, directive for private equity companies, the process of STS securitization in the capital markets union, all these are a, a complex of de-risking measures who, with a specific intention of making it easier to transform houses into asset classes. Then you have fiscal de-risking at national level because this is not something that the European fiscal capacity exists to do and that goes from the uh, tax treatment of um, particular types of equity, uh, housing equity, uh, to the way in which financial uh, governments, particularly in the periphery, under the pressures of the ECB's decision of how to deal with the uh, uh, sovereign debt crisis, set out bad banks to mop up the housing crisis and use the state balance sheet just as a vehicle to put houses into, into institutional ownership. And that's a, the, the case of the Sareb uh, Bank in Spain, the bad bank, is a very powerful example of that, I think. <coughs> we also have monetary the risking there in the ECB's collateral treatment of mortgage-backed securities. Um, that is an example of, again, monetary the risking. The more interesting one that I'm, looking, that I'm working on now is Repower Europe, the new plan to reduce European dependencies on Russian fossil fuels through shifting into alternative sources of uh, energy and green hydrogen. Green hydrogen is the next big thing. I am convinced, not because I wanted to, but because, uh, funnily enough, the Germans wanted to. For the German uh, government and the German industries, the idea is that you can transform your local industries, you can decarbonize them by encouraging them with measures of fiscal de-risking, like carbon contracts for difference, to a move into green hydrogen or green ammonium as a source of um, uh, energy. Of course, this requires high capital investment and that's why you have fiscal de-risking. And I've just given you here, there an example of the way in which this is already changing political economies in various African countries that I have started since May this year in African Green Hydrogen Alliance. And Germany is developing green, partnership, uh, green hydrogen partnerships with several countries in, uh, very importantly uh, to study, I think, is uh, Namibia. And this, to me, then uh, brings up the question of how do we organize decarbonization in the story of European stranger things as a small green de-risking state. 
And there are several measures that one can contemplate that are already moving into the direction of regulatory de-risking through the sustainable finance taxonomy, of fiscal de-risking. And I think the, example, the interesting example for fiscal de-risking is the way in which the German energy policy has encouraged or supported the emergence of a, a renewable energy market, but not a renewable energy industry. Uh, and this is a long story to tell here, but if you read the piece that I've published in uh, the German Jacobin, and this gentleman in the back uh, uh, thinks that it's a very good translation of, of my, of my uh, English, you, if you can read the story there, it is a story of Germany pioneering fiscal de-risking measures in order to mobilize private capital and to create a, a renewable energy market. The same logic of fiscal de-risking is in carbon contracts for difference that we can discuss uh, in the question and answer session that are at the core of Repower Europe. There is very little new money in Repower Europe, and that, the, the new money that is there is going to be used for basically providing incentives or mobilizing private capital into green hydrogen um, uh, projects to decarbonize industries that cannot be decarbonized with renewable energy. Uh, the LNG contracts, there is a lot of debate in, in Germany about them. The logic there is, again, the state has provided some de-risking measures, and the hope is that the, the LNG terminals will be uh, transformed into green hydrogen terminals to receive the billions in um, uh, 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 imports of green hydrogen that uh, Germany is planning for. And uh, beyond the European Union, we also have the growing reliance on public-private partnerships, which is the most... Uh, normalized vehicle for fiscal de-risking. It's quite big here, but I, I haven't found a lot of research on, on Germany's PPPs. I would be interested to do that. But they have been pushed as a way of mobilizing trillions for SDG development in countries in the global south. Uh, and the latest G20 meeting where the Partnership for Global Infrastructure in, in Investment was announced, again, relies on this logic of de-risking. Of course, then the, we still have the monetary de-risking in the ECB decarbonization agenda. And since last week, this, has, this story has complicated a little bit. Uh, but I would say both the OMT and the recent interventions are an example of monetary de-risking. So this is where I think where we are now. We are in an age of a small de-risking state where the institutional and political economy of this, the various types of de-risking is these institutions are being set into place. The political economy differences are being ironed out, right? Because it's a very, to my mind, it's a very broad political project that doesn't have a very uh, clear driver, but it somehow is happening because of the macroeconomic dogmas and commitment to the paradigm of uh, monetary dominance and central bank independence. And I would argue that there are three important consequences for this. One is that we can't be very hopeful about decarbonization with this, with this approach. Then the Global South can be very hopeful about decarbonization either. Uh, and in particular, both here and in countries in the Global South, it, it de facto privatizes and financializes public good from water to education, to hospitals, to airports, to prisons, everything you can think of can become an asset class as long as the state assumes some risks and makes it easier for uh, private investors to come in. Um, then we are in season four, and I thought this is enough as a picture for season four. <laughs> Anybody knows what happened today? Yeah. Were, you, were you clicked onto Twitter? <laughs> today we are at parity with a dollar. I think this is enough of a story. I mean, it's, it's much more complicated. I'm being a bit glib here. Um, but we are in a particularly difficult moment in the macro financial history of the Eurozone because we are using the wrong tools to solve some problems that uh, have very uh, structural uh, challenges and cannot be sorted out by this uh, small de-risking state. So where do we go from here? And I think there is a lot to be done. First is to develop more broadly a political economy of the de-risking state. What I have mapped out for you here, besides with my European stranger things or stranger European things uh, story, is the way in which the building blocks for uh, the risking governance regime or, or, or logic have been put into place, not in a very orderly fashion. There is no big mastermind, besides, despite the fact that I, I somehow intimated it at the beginning with these monsters uh, that, that lurk around in the upside down. 
there is no big driver, but what we are seeing is these building blocks being increasingly normalized and articulated together in a coherent political project, I would say. I'm not, I'm not a political scientist, I'm, a, I'm an economist that doubles down as a political economist. So I would like to invite the political scientists and political economists to work more on this political economy of the de-risking state. First, by looking at varieties of monetary de-risking. What does monetary de-risking look like in a high inflation regime? Um, and that's why I would say that this approach sort of creates some space for central bank agency because we now, we now know that not all central banks are the same, and some central banks do monetary de-risking with more ease than others. And of course, the ECB now is the case study to study some forms of monetary de-risking where it's, more, it's less uh, ambitious, like um, the interventions in government bond markets, and some forms of monetary de-risking that are very ambitious, like penalties on dirty assets that have been announced last week and which to me is still a, a form of de-risking, but one where the central bank is providing a much more ambitious approach. I can see people disagreeing, it's fine. I'm not saying that they will solve the climate crisis, I'm saying that this is more ambitious than uh, simply dismissing them as uh, agents of private capital. It, the story is not that, that easy. Then we have varieties of fiscal de-risking, which is to say that the entire project of decarbonization without changing the relationship between the central bank and the Ministry of Finance, and however we want to call it a Ministry of Industry, will mean just new forms of, of, of fiscal de-risking that are, or instruments of fiscal de-risking that are used in order to try to decarbonize in a market-led fashion. So I would, I, would, I'm, I would be interested to, I think there is a lot of interest, uh, uh, interesting stories to be told about the growing uh, uh, economy, green hydrogen economy uh, and, and partnerships around green hydrogen, the return of industrial policy. Remember Sven Giegold wrote in the Financial Times that industrial policy is back, but he's not going to pick winners, which is a strange form of industrial policy if you ask the economist in me, but that is where we are now. Concepts are being emptied of their original meaning, uh, and that I see it as a particular upside down kind of uh, a move. Um, then to relate this age of de-risking with subordinated financialization, with what is happening in the monetary and fiscal domain in countries in the global so south, and then to think more critically about what actually can be achieved with a de-risking state, however varied in its nature, if it doesn't reform market-based finance, if it doesn't challenge the supremacy of the US dollar and the, the global dollar financial cycle, which is wrecking hav havoc, in countries in the global south as, as we speak. In Europe, well, depending on where you stand, whether you think uh, parity is good or not, uh, in Europe, uh, uh, um, the global dollar financial cycle is also um, showing up its, I think, relevance. And then under fossilflation, the idea that somehow decarbonization will create inflationary pressures raises very difficult political economy questions. And when Isabel Schnabel said this, we, I took it very seriously because it creates trade-offs for the central bank. The central bank does not have tools to sort out, at least, in, to my mind, in a satisfactory manner, and that they, they end up generating very stop-and-go, deflationary, then inflationary, or stagflationary periods. The second one, and I don't have time to go into it, you can ask Ben about it, because we are, we are writing, is to imagine alternatives, right? Because, uh, you know, as these kids in um, Stranger Things, we don't want to be trapped in a constant battle against the increasingly sophisticated monsters that incidentally, this is a story of the internet arriving and changing uh, very nice childhoods where you were riding your bike, not staring at your mobile phone. Um, we want to map out what are the alternatives and there can be worse than the small de-risking state. And we describe this with Isabella Weber as carbon shock therapy and there can be I would say better because I am a Keynesian who believes in the power of the state and in the necessity to occupy the state in order to plan decarbonization. Uh, how do we do that without repeating the mistakes of authoritarianism and with having, Jens, I are there, with having technocratic Keynesians, this I would recognize when they help plan the, 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 the decarbonization or the green transition, then I would call central banks. Uh, technocratic Keynesians. That's it. I, yeah. That's it. Thank you very much. And sorry I took so long.
Great, thank you so much, Daniela. Now we have time for Q&A. So, um, yep, I see already many hands up. Thank you, Daniela. This was great. <clears throat> As I confessed to you yesterday, I've never watched this series because I don't watch these series, but I found it quite intriguing. I think my question is where do the monsters come from? So in the European story and in other stories of state de-risking, de and I think that's what your critique of my um, uh, liquidity conduit was as, as well. I mean, Draghi is giving sugar at night to the monsters down there, right? I mean, the, the monsters are not from a separate world. They emerge from the upside world and so so I'm just I'm just I'm just wondering about that and the, the second question I really had you know in some ways you could say there are a lot of other de-risking strategies that have happened right I mean I call the entire legal system as the mother of all subsidies the private law that creates priority rights for some who know how to um, avail themselves of these of these rights you could say you know um, export credits in the past were also you know de-risking strategies so I'm just wondering where you you know where, where the de-risking is different from Subsidization, you said, sort of normal industrial policy. Um, what, what is sort of the specific um, thing? You could say maybe that's a small state that uses the capital markets in a different way, but I'd, I'd just like to hear a little bit more about this. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, would you mind if we take like at least most two questions at a time? Because I haven't written anything and my long COVID brain I can't uh, probably remember so you can more than two now. questions. Huh? You can respond now. Please. Okay, okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh, now I see I forgot your first question. <laughs> Wait, wait, no, 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 I will do it. Where do the monsters come from? Where, yes. Where... Very good. Okay, so where, where do the monsters come from? So are, have I convinced you to watch this series or not? N no. Because then I have to give away some of the plot and some of the plot of the, of the I don't remember, season three or season four is that we humans create all the monsters one way or another. And the, the story of the, the monsters that are coming in the form of a glut of institutional capital is a story of the state withdrawing from the provision of public goods and moving our forms of providing or of dealing with uncertainties of the future to the market. There is, it's not incidental that private, that pension funds and insurance companies are the largest pools of institutional capital that are going around and giving money to BlackRock to manage so that the BlackRock can then uh, work with uh, governments to create the risking partnerships. I think it's a consequence of the fact that we have privatized or semi-privatized health systems. We have privatized, we're privatizing uh, um, pension systems and we are creating a, pressure, a search for yield simply for these types of financial institutions to be able to, to, to meet the commitments towards their contributors that in theory, if we are honest, they cannot meet them because this financial system is subject to cycles of liquidity and, and leverage that are too disruptive in nature to be, uh, to be creating the conditions for you know, nice cash flows to pensioners everywhere. So what is happening, this is my interpretation, is a lot has to do with the uh, changes in the European social contract with a specific nature of American capitalism. And I didn't say it here, but I mean, you can tell a story of the upside and the upside down with uh, the first wave of uh, American financial capitalism up to the creation of the, well, uh, including the creation of the Federal Reserve and then the crisis in 1929. It's still, it's the same story of plumbing, the same, the same story of uh, secular and structural pressures in the upside down. Uh, and it, it probably doesn't necessarily need I mean, I, I'm not that familiar with American capitalism to give you an extensive history of it, but it comes from the same pressures of how do we deal with futures that are uncertain one way or another. So that's the first one. And the second one is, this is a question that many people have asked. And in, in this piece on in the German Jacobin, I try to deal with it a little bit while also not overwhelming the German reader with 8,000 words on, on, on critical macrofinance. Uh, which I probably, prob at least the editors uh, said might happen. Uh, and the, the definition of the risking that I use there are state interventions to change risk returns of financial assets, which is very diff different from industrial de-risking where you provide certain subsidies and guarantees, but the ultimate aim of these interventions is to either grow some winners, some industrial winners, to direct credit into certain areas 
they are, they, the logic is guided by a different pub, set of public uh, priorities. So in a sense, the, the, the strategy of the, the instrument of the risk might look the same, but the aim is very different, right? Here there is no, in a sense, uh, explicit interventions. For example, if you think even of the ways in which the ECB is thinking to decarbonize the financial system, it says, well, I, I will also play with relative risk returns because I'm going to make it more expensive to create dirty assets. I'm going to make it more expensive to create or cheaper to create green assets, but I express no specific preferences for what should be the level or the quantity of credit flows that goes into each sector, right? If there was a, a strategy of industrial or de-risking for industrial purposes, then the, the European Central Bank would say, well, the European finance industrial ministers have told me uh, X, amount, X billions of credit have to be given to green hydrogen sectors in these European countries. I'm going to ensure that this amount of credit flows there. So the, the, the logic of the risking is different and I should make that more explicit when I define it. Yes. Yeah, well, you anticipate my question. So industrial de-risking would be circuit du trésor, right? Would be? Like the, 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 the circuit of uh, Benjamin Lemoyne and Eric yeah. Monet, uh -huh. that would be industrial de-risking. Yes. But your today, the de risking is financial de-risking. But you say it's the same nature of the instrument. So what, what's changed? But so, so what is our criteria that we want to build a taxonomy of the different uh, uh, instrument of de-risking, right? Because if you want to engage in a normative criticism, then it's not enough to say that de-risking state is bad because state has always de-risk uh, a private investment. So what is the criteria that we want? And Shouldn't, shouldn't it be the distributive consequences, right? So with the winners and the losers between the state and the private firm. And I think that, that, that would change a lot uh, because this is actually what changes from the uh, post-World War II uh, Fordist organization with our two-day organization. Like the articulation between state and private players is not so different, but like the gains that are distributed between both radically changed. So should we use this distributive criteria? Do you have other criteria in mind to, to, have, to, to, to be able to distinguish what are the good de-risking that we should strive for and what is the bad that we want to avoid? Yeah. Yes, this is a very good question. And I've been, I've been, I would say, struggling with this in the sense of, I mean, I don't want to call it financial de-risking because uh, Katarina is right. There is, there is legal de-risking and it can be d done in allowing private legal actors to write the rules which make it easier for financial institutions to create new types of asset classes. There is regulatory de-risking, there is fiscal, there is monetary. There are many ways in which you can, you can arrange de-risking. So the, the, the de-risking co constellations can be look differently depending on what is the kind of overriding logic that, that organizes them or the macrofinancial regime that organizes them. And maybe I should be more careful that you're right. I think the distributive question is very important because the logic of de-risking asset classes for private finance or, or escorting ca private capital into new pr in private investable projects or even state, well, there is somehow at some removed but still state-owned projects, is uh, how do I make it easier for private capital to go there but I, not, with, not with the attached question of how does private capital both have some discipline in receiving these subsidies and how does it share the benefits of the risking in ways that also benefit me, right? So you do, I don't just socialize their losses and they keep their gains. So you're right, maybe the, the, the distribu distributional aspect is very important because in, in effect, and I said this at some point, but I didn't make it strong enough, is that there is a redistribution of risks and that also has broader redistributional consequences in the sense that it is clearly a political game, game to assign profits and to c contain losses uh, for, for both the private system, for the private capital and the state. And I'm, I'm writing now a piece with Ndongo, Sambasila from uh, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Senegal, where we're looking at green, the green hydrogen pro, uh, partnerships that Germany is signing with, in this case with Namibia, we're using Namibia as a case study because it's easier in some ways since 
it's quite advanced and it has a lot of the risking there and even the 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 logic of the 10 billion US dollar green hydrogen project in Namibia, it says, uh, first, a, a private investment to establish Namibia as a, as a green hydrogen player, de-risking to scale up uh, the project. So it, it's, in, it's in the title of the, of the project, which makes it, in a sense, easier for, for our argument. And what we are saying there is that maybe the Namibian state can combine de-risking for commodity production for becoming an, an exporter of green hydrogen commodities, right? Because this is going to become, the, we, there is a political economy struggle over what is the new green hydrogen commodity market going to look like globally. And the sad truth of it in a, in a way is that China is so far ahead in competitive terms that it's I, not, not that Namibia, I, I don't think even Germany or any European country with the kind of political economy we have at the moment and with the macro financial regime we have at the moment, we can never catch up with that. So what we are saying is, well, you can do commodity de-risking so to generate some revenues and then you should do the green developmental state to try to set up your own kind of di distributional processes locally that create some local green industries. Because if you rely on the Germans to de-risk your uh, green industrial policy, forget about it, uh, it's not going to happen. It's just, it just doesn't make any sense. So, I think also we have to study the possibility that these two have to go hand in hand. You know, moving away from the comfortable leftist position of throwing bombs at the people who do things and uh, criticizing them, trying to be, I don't know if constructive is the word because I'm still a perma cynical, uh, cynical person, but, but trying to think through like, is there some way in which these two can be combined in a way that benefits also the state and the citizens, but in a meaningful structural way, not just a transformative way, not just, you know, the story in Namibia now is, well, the Namibian state will benefit because we are going to give them an equity stake in this project that is financed by a German, is, is done by a German company with a private equity co uh, company. So these are, it's just a constellation of what I call the Wall Street consensus and they would, they're expecting Namibia to issue 500 million uh, green bonds to buy their equity stake, which would basically double their foreign, car their foreign or their euro bond debt is mental. I mean, the project to me is very strange. Uh, and I don't, I mean, also I'm, I know I'm a European sitting here and being wise about what people in uh, countries with a much more difficult political economy are doing. But I want to point the finger at <laughs> the people around here, uh, wherever they are, who are creating again the false promises of the risking and very explicitly so. Um, so yes, I will, thank you, that's a good suggestion. Uh, great, thank you, Daniela. That was that talk was about as good as it gets. I think my question is about this figure behind you and the typology. Although I think it probably might help us to also think about, you know, types of de-risking that amplify shocks rather than allow it to be um, allow it to be absorbed. So it seems, if we look at this, that the difference between big green state and small green de-risking state is quite big. It seems like the gap between small green de-risking state and carbon shock therapy is not so great. How close are we to going into carbon shock therapy? What are the kind of things that are preventing that from happening or are they already happening? Well, I would have said yes before I had a, a lunchtime conversation with Ben and where are the other two? Uh, the, the here is uh, the colleague, I'm sorry, I should remember your name, but you convinced me that Germany is not sleepwalking into carbon shock therapy, is my, my answer until this. So the, the idea of carbon shock therapy, just to clarify for those of you who are, have not read the piece that we published, is that to take an analogy from my childhood, as you see, this, you're getting to see my childhood in very different ways uh, today. So my childhood was spent in the 1990s in Romania. Uh, and Romania was one of the countries that was very much a subject of experiments with shock therapy that I would attribute not only, but uh, very importantly to Jeffrey Sachs, who somehow is not paying for, for his experiments in Eastern Europe. And the logic of shock therapy was, well, you know, the Romanian or formerly planned economy has uh, industrial sectors and state-owned companies that are a, shouldn't be allowed to exist or to be subjected to market forces in a way that they can prove their competitiveness in the market. 
So what they did was to say, to make sure that you can prove your competitiveness, we're going to take away your access to credit, we're going to increase the price of your imports, we're going to increase the price of your labor, um, we're going to re re withdraw all fiscal support and try to leave. And uh, the story is very clear, the combination of monetary and fiscal austerity, which was the logic of the Washington consensus, which I didn't have time to go into, but I'm assuming you're familiar with it, was, to say, was explicitly a logic of structural transformation of transition. And this is very striking to me to read about the decarbonization or the green transition now, because it's the same language that we heard in Eastern Europe with an uh, undershock therapy, right? And what, where is the parallel there? The, the, the sort of economic reasoning and legitimacy for it was to say, well, the problem with uh, the socially plan, with centrally planned economy is that it doesn't get prices right. It sets prices in a way that will never lead to a proper allocation of capital. It creates disturbances, white elephants, problems that are so insurmountable that the only thing to do is to get prices right. So that's what the logic, and this is the same logic of increasing carbon prices. It starts from the assumption that the market cannot generate the right price signals in the same way that the plan could not generate the, the right price signals. So what you need to do is somehow put aside all your political instincts that say, well, you shouldn't really increase carbon prices because you don't have a plan of what to do with the poor people who will lose their jobs. In Eastern Europe, they said, well, let the poor people deal with it. They had 40 years of communism now, time to pay for it in some way or another. Uh, don't love this. I think there was a, some people thought that we had, a, we had it good for a very long time, although in Romania, we didn't have it very good because we had a crazy guy in charge. So yeah, it was a bit complicated. Anyway, so, so then we have, I think this, the, the the right wing call for the, the right wing who accepts there is a, a climate crisis says, OK, but why do we need a state in there? This will make things worse. Just increase carbon prices or change price signals and also make sure to implement monetary and fiscal austerity, because if you don't, the, mar the price signal will not work. You cannot shield private companies from the price signal, if you continue to give them subsidies like Germany has done for a while, or if you continue to give them monetary subsidies or access to preferential credit. So the logic is take away all the uh, mechanisms for support that exist, and if they survive, great, then they can decarbonize. And I think in some way this is what it could be happening, I thought, in global countries in the global south, because the IMF is now gearing up a whole institutional mechanism to say, well, we need structural transformation, we need decarbonization. You guys don't have money. You, we don't trust your central banks to do anything else but, but target prices, increase carbon prices, and let's see what happens. And, but somehow, uh, our neighbor from the east has decided that maybe Germany should try this approach first. Uh, and this is where we are. I would say, I mean, I, I have to confess, and this is why the colleague here convinced me that maybe I am a little bit uh, too uh, dispectative with the German capacity to plan. Because I thought that Germany doesn't, I mean, what is required over the next six to one months to one year in most countries that have to decarbonize rapidly is to say, okay, if we don't go with the price signal, because the, the German state could just sit back and say, well, I mean, okay, maybe decarbonization has arrived a bit earlier than we expected, because frankly, this is the kind of price that we should see if we are serious about increasing uh, or decarbonizing. We should see very high prices for natural gas and for oil. So if you are a right-wing government, you could say, well, OK, go for it, guys. Let's see how you survive in, in, a, in, a, in an environment where Russia is no longer subsidizing your ability to delay decarbonization. You could tell this, this as a story as well. And uh, my sense is that the governments, and I'm, not, I'm, just sometimes, I'm joking about Germany because I think in some ways we are allowed to joke about Germany in the euro area and, and in Europe since. Uh, Germany is the reluctant he hegemon of Europe, uh, but it's not just Germany. All countries in the Euro area and the, the European Union have to deal with this, my own country as well. And I don't think that we have, first, the institutions and the macroeconomic narrative in place to be able to do that. So what we'll end up having is some form of carbon shock therapy that if it is as painful as my childhood was for a lot of people, or the 1990s were for a lot of people in Eastern Europe, is not going to be pretty. Not at all.
Thank you also from my side for this very funny, first of all, and very interesting talk. Um, my question kind of regards the role of risk management and the role of the state in the transition kind of from a paradigm of monetary dominance to fiscal dominance. So kind of if the state is an actor of de-risking in the order liberal paradigm, what is the role of the state in the socio-ecological transition? Is it kind of a role of maybe risk internalization, especially when we talk about, you know, stranded assets and that in the last instance, the state has a very special role on top of the kind of monetary hierarchy? And then uh, the second question is a little bit funny. Um, have you met Sven Giegold and have you talked about uh, kind of order liberalism with him? Thank you. Okay, so maybe I, I, I will start with, so if I understood correctly, your question is what does the state, the small green state do with respect to green asset, to um, stranded assets or? Oh, what? Uh -huh. So, um, I mean, the, the big green state is, 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 is to me a configuration that tries to close down all the potential mechanisms and avenues through which it is possible for private finance to escape the conditions or the attempts of the small green state to, to try to decarbonize, right? So uh, stranded assets or, or fossil assets are in a sense quite interesting in that respect because what we have seen, even where we have some credible efforts from central banks or regulatory authorities to say, okay, you have to get rid of some pension funds have to get rid of some of uh, um, dirty assets or I don't know, shell or, or total uh, bonds. What, what it happens is that private equity funds are, are buying them and then managing them, often with the same uh, allocations from the uh, public pension fund that used to own that, that asset in the first place. So it's a, lit a little bit like a dog chasing its tail. And of course, the difficult question then is, the reality, as I understand it, is that what we need to do now is not to invent new technologies or new things, is we need to stop digging fossil fuels from the ground. And that means that some, I think only some centralized state authority can say, we'll have to stop these things and we'll have to create, and I think if, uh, I think this was online when Hendrik Boll, or, or this is online when Hendrik Boll Foundation organized this conference, in May, some of you might have been here. There was a, a very interesting, and I have to say, as a, as a union member, there was a, I, I was very happy because some of my union reps in the UK are not as effective uh, fighting uh, on, against uh, our government uh, in the same way that this lady was. And she said, look, I'm in charge of just transition plans for a union or for a European Confederation of Trade Unions. And the problem is unions are always portrayed as resisting decarbonization because uh, they have vested interests or they have jobs in fossil fuel sectors. And you think, okay, fair enough, but if these people are told you'll, ha you'll not longer have your nice job in an oil company, but you have to have a precarious job trying to learn how to install solar panels somewhere, of course they resist it. I mean, it just makes sense. I would resist, in the same way I'm resisting attempts to make my job pre precarious. So the question of stranded assets is indeed the state has to take it over, but, but work with trade unions in the same way, in the way that this, uh, uh, trade union is proposed, which is to say trade unions want to deal with climate change, but they want to see me good jobs attached to the just transition. Not big spe uh, speeches, because big speeches, everybody now wants a just transition, which is crazy. When I hear BlackRock speaking about just transitions, uh, I, my, my eyes cannot stop rolling. I have to close them uh, for just a second. Uh, there is no, just transition means meaningful jobs for the people who are getting hit, not for uh, the receivers of financial yield from uh, stranded assets. So you're right, it's a very difficult question. And I, I understand, I don't know if anybody here has experience. Eric Monet told me that there is a lot of interesting research done on the 1970s and 1980s on how, you, how the French government closed down industries that thought were no longer profitable or competitive. I'm, I don't know that the French state is a good example of this, I cannot say. But I think it would be interesting to look at experiences with the state easing bankruptcies of certain sectors or companies in a way that kind of makes sense, but both socially and, and politically. It's very difficult. There are no easy answers. This is why we have this proliferation of the de-risking state, because it's the easy political solution always to say, well, we can't do much, but the private sector will do it. 
if we just dish out a little bit of some form of subsidy or guarantee. Ah, and the second, oh, did I? Well, I know Sven Giegel from my, our time at, on the same side of the barricade, trying to change the European financial system. I think, I would say that Sven Giegel is an interesting uh, example of somebody who's trying to create some momentum for uh, decarbonization through the strategic mobilization of ordo liberalism. Now, this opens up many kinds of worlds because apparently every German has a different opinion on who is ordo liberal and who deserves to be called one. And I, I, for me, this is not so important uh, since I don't particularly have any stakes in it. But he does use the, the overall logic of or the overall umbrella of green ordo liberalism to say, we have to do a lot more things than ordo liberalism, ordo liberalism probably would agree with, at least the ordo liberals of the 1940s and 1950s. But this is the only way forward. I mean, in a sense, they were unlucky, I would say, the German Greens, because uh, to, have, to come into government and then have uh, Russia invading Ukraine is a very difficult thing anyways, uh, much more difficult when you're green and then you have to end up t t having to choose between coal and nuclear. And I don't even, I, I, I think my, I just want to say this in support of uh, Sven Giegel. Uh, and agrees that in some ways, I think these are the fact that for the next six months and one year, Germany is going to have to dig more fossil fuels out of the ground, to me, would not be such a problem if it was accompanied by some credible plan of structural transformation. Because the hard truth is, okay, you, you need to keep he building city, then you need to keep some of your industries alive in some way, uh, uh, manner or other, because if you lose elections, you might, might not lose them to people who want to do planning. But yeah, this is very difficult to, to discuss in some ways. And I think we have to be, maybe because I'm growing, getting old, I now am more willing to think of political compromises. I don't know. Um, yeah. Um, um, on, on political uh, compromises, so I saw this. The, uh, ben also present the, uh, the regimes yesterday and I finally now I've sort of gathered my thought because I think it's very powerful taxonomy but it strikes me that there is something very much in between the small de-risking state and the uh, big green state and I think that comes out nicely with the issue of housing which I think I think your report on housing is really incredibly uh, insightful particularly the the study of the Dutch situation where you have on the one hand these privatized pension funds that then, then via U.S. asset managers investing back into housing that used to be social housing, right? So you used to just have these uh, funded directly via the government budget, and now we're funding it via Wall Street. That's exactly this uh, situation. And then I think that has been enabled by this small de-risking state. But now I guess there is something emerging in between these two options that is definitely not the big green state, but that is in various ways creating risks for investments that are not sufficiently uh, uh, energy efficient and that in that sense are really also not, not the de-risking state. So you have the um, ECB measures that you already mentioned, screening the, the assets themselves much more as collateral, also pushing the credit rating agencies now to take all these uh, uh, energy efficiency criteria into account in designing credit ratings. That might then also impact credit ratings even outside Europe. Then also uh, Repower uh, EU, you already mentioned, really starting to impose mandatory uh, deadlines for energy efficiency measures on social housing, on private rent, and then uh, also EBA now uh, requiring detailed disclosures of these energy efficiency requirements on level of housing, right? So this mm -hmm. is this seems to be much more a traditional regulatory state, so not using the government budget, but rules to cause risk for financial uh, assets as a lever to to create uh, a green transition. So that's like, I guess the bit of Sven Giegold green ordo uh, world, and, and I thought that that doesn't seem to fit into the third or the second category very neatly. Yes. Um, I'm not sure. So I've been, I've been, I mean, in a sense, it was, 
neater to argue this in a, in a time when most central banks would say, or most regulators would say, well, you know, we'll subsidize green, but we'll not penalize dirty. Because I think one, one of the arguments around the small green state or the de-risking state is that it bribes financial actors without penalizing them. But I think that, that maybe was a bit too narrow a definition in the sense that, the, of course, the logic of the risking is not to say that you only reduce the risks for a type of assets that, you, that somehow are consistent with your public policy priorities, but you also increase the risks for other assets that are inconsistent with your public policy priorities. So to me, it still belongs there in the second category in the sense that the state is saying, I want less credit flows in this, and I want more credit flows into this, but I don't express a preference about the specific nature of the credit flows. I just set up some broad par uh, not parameters for why it should be more expensive for you to invest in, of course, to invest in this kind of asset classes, right? Or, and okay, maybe when the state mandates that it says, okay, if you don't have, I don't know, I, I have to read a bit more about it. Uh, does the, the Dutch state say, if you don't have this, don't meet this energy requirements, then? Uh-huh. So this is part of Repower EU, and then, or that broader drive, I mean, don't get me on the specifics, and then, on the um, bank disclosure side, also these very detailed templates that require disclosure of energy, energy efficiency certificates uh -huh. also immediately mean that that can feed into every yeah. part of the supervisory process. So I guess that's, that is causing very real uh, risk, but I, I think your response also holds that that is a way. Yeah, I mean, I would say it is the extreme of the uh, regu regulatory de-risking in the, where the state basically says, well, this kind of risk cannot exist, right? Which is what the, the Dutch state seems to be saying is the, that you cannot have a asset classes with some sp particular characteristics anymore because they are not consistent with your uh, with the public policy priorities. So I, I have to think more about this, whether it really, I mean, I'm not su suggesting that the age of the de-risking state means that the, that the other things that the state does disappear. They, they don't disappear. There is just a new logic of governance and of governing that is becoming increasingly driven by the risking, not that everything else falls, falls away. I mean, I don't have the, I, I'm not saying there's some big institutional rapture happening here. But yeah, I'll think about it more. Um, um, thank you so much for your talk. I can follow well all the arguments, and I have the question regarding this point on the big green state. Um, and I'm wondering to what extent is that applicable to the countries in the global south? Because, I mean, if we consider the countries in the periphery in import dependency and foreign capital dependency, we are actually de risking the state is often kind of the means for the governments to access capital, or that's also how they often justify if this kind of cases uh, pop up for public, that that's the way to uh, attract the FDI to the country. So if they say no to that, um, uh, where does the money come from for them for the, the green industrial policy? Very good. I think that's a, <laughs> uh, that's a very legitimate question. And hopefully this uh, piece on, on the green hydrogen uh, dreams of uh, several African countries uh, that hopefully will come out in the Boston Review soon. It, it clarifies that, of course, one cannot just assume that because, uh, I, I don't know, somebody dreams of or has a, and I think what we have to recognize for countries in the global south and Namibia is a very clear example of that, is that for 40 years, there was, n there was no space, like significant policy space, to have a developmentalist ideology that we had in the 1950s and 60s and in some post-colonial states in, in Africa, right? And this space for a developmental, de developmentalist ideology is back. So when you read the, the, the government of Namibia's plans for green hydrogen, they say explicitly industrial policy, structural transformation. I mean, 
if you didn't look in the, the open up the black box of what do they mean in practice, it just reads like the, the it green, uh, the developmental state is back, okay? And, of, and so I think that's an important part to recognize that the ideological terrain on which the de-risking state is playing has changed massively since uh, the days of the Washington Consensus. And uh, we also have to think through the, the, or to accept that even if this ideological terrain has changed, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden Namibia could afford to say, well, you know, these investors are bringing 10 billion FDI into my country, and maybe I will have an equity stake in it, maybe not. There is a lot of uh, debate around it, but if we park it for a second, it's very difficult to say no to that, right? And I know this from uh, other countries where, of course, there is both a financial dependency and, then the, and there is a technological dependency, right? So you say, okay, these investors are ready to come. They, they also have plans to educate Namibians in, uh, in uh, I think, in Munich University basically to, to create a small workforce for the green hydrogen industry. It's very small. I mean, this, this project, which is 10 billion, is larger than the GDP of Namibia for 2021, is promising to create 3,000 permanent jobs. And I, don't, I think the well, Heinrich Boll Foundation has like 1,000, right? Or I don't know how many employees it has, but 3,000 jobs for uh, the equivalent of an annual uh, economic output is very little. Um, however, so going back to your question, if this is an opportunity, because the ideological space is mu much more open, uh, the way in which this can become an opportunity for countries in the global south, it, this is a political economy question. So let's say, yes, Namibia is able to put this uh, green hydrogen project together, or, or South Africa has one, Senegal has several. Everybody's constructing green hydrogen valleys everywhere. And if they are able to somehow become a, a green ammonia, meaning in the case of Namibia actually it's not green hydrogen, but the, a green hydrogen or green ammonia ex exporter and to acquire some uh, export revenues because they are very good at negotiating with uh, the foreign investors how to distribute these, then maybe then there is a space to do some form of a big green state. And this is the argument we are making in this piece that there, to, to do that, to create a big green state or some state-led industrial policy, you cannot rely on the risking because the logic that it is there now in the project is to, for Namibia to do industrialization by invitation, as Tandika Makandawire used to call it, which is I invite foreign investors to develop industries. For me, this never works because it just translates into a race to the bottom of what kind of nice measures for mobilizing capital you create. So it's again going back at the... You know, I mean, I, of course, I'm not saying that all the experiments of the 1950s and 1960s with the developmental state were successful. Most of them were not. But the, the, truth, of, the truth of structural transformation is that there is no good evidence that a private sector can organize it in an orderly way, particularly when it generates the kind of social costs that is going to generate in most countries. So that, that, that space is then to becomes, okay, how do I use the revenues that I get in order to create. <clears throat> and one suggestion that I got from somebody today on this, commenting on the piece that we're writing is, why isn't Germany creating industrial partnership in the, uh, alongside the hydrogen partnerships with Namibia? I mean, if it's serious about structural transformation, it shouldn't just create the space for commodity extraction because Namibia has water, water that it can desalinate, it has wind and energy that can create green hydrogen, but it should also do what China is doing. You know, we always talk badly about China in countries in the global south, particularly in Africa. But China is the only country I know of that has an industrial partnership in creating green mobility with, for example, Uganda. So this is what I would say, if we want to rescue the world partnerships from the de-risking agenda, then it has to go beyond, you know, finding clever ways to sell your local project to Wall Street, is finding ways in which you can create local industries with the help of and, and I think in some ways, this is also, it has to trigger some important questions here. I mean, can the German industry be this big in Germany if it has to be decarbonized? And maybe, maybe not. But these are, I mean, I'm from Romania. I, I've, we've gone through the largest deindustrialization de and the most disorderly deindustrialization that probably the entire continent has had, well, maybe except for Russia, in the last hundred years. And, and usually, I mean, the, some of the, a, a cynical account of it is that <clears throat> the industrialization in Eastern Europe was very functional for Western capital. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not very hopeful, but at least this is the where, where I would go. Um, thank you, Daniela, for your very interesting uh, presentation. It's always interesting to listen to you. Um, I'm really like uh, I'm not I'm not even close an expert on these topics. I know almost nothing, but I got I mean some part of my question was addressed here when you were discussing Namibia and the African countries and isn't uh, about this of the global south because I didn't quite uh, understand that in your presentation. It got kind of confusing for me when you said that uh, you were expecting that developing countries or the global south had a risk of becoming a consumer and not a producer of green energy. And that is was kind of a bit confusing for me because I worked with green energy project in the south, as specifically in Brazil. And of course we have uh, different legislation on how the energy market works. But we had like a kind of a this really de risking state there because you had a state promoting, like saying, I'm going to buy all the energy that you produce. And you had a developing bank that is not going to finance the project, but creating bridge loans. So you gave like de risk and the, the risk for the banking sector. So I had in mind, in my mind at least, that the risk was actually to get everything privatized. Because of course that uh, that strategy is more profitable for the capital sector, and the risk was also to increase balance of payment constraint because you will increase your import content instead, and of course you have distributional consequence of the projects that you make, like displacing people to create wind farms and biomass projects that were in place in the early 2000s. So that was kind of confusing for me when you you put it like that, but I think it, I was kind of wrong. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. No, no, I, I apologize. It, I, I think I should have been more clear. So I'm not saying that countries do not, that countries in the global south or everywhere cannot generate their own renewable energy. They become uh, consumers of green technology, right? So in order to put, I don't know, the wind turbines or the hydrogen uh, pipelines or the desalination plant or the plant that takes the hydrogen and transforms it into a green ammonia or the electrolyzers. All this is green tech or clean tech that needs to be imported and of course generates balance of payments dynamics. But the, the idea would be, and if you look for example at uh, Kenya or South Africa, there were some attempts to try to create their own industries to create their own solar panels or their own wind turbines. And of course then the question is, is, the, is, is it China or is, uh, I don't know, Germany or Europe, the, the real competitor for these countries. But again, uh, I think the ambition would be that there will be some autonomous capacity to create green, green technologies uh, and to manufacture green, te manufacture green technologies locally so you don't accelerate your balance of payment your, or your trade deficits and your current account imbalances. So that's what I meant. I'm not saying that countries do not have, and I, I guess one of the advantages of trying to, one of the reasons why, for example, Germany is pushing these green hydrogen partnerships is basically that it, there are countries who have abundant resources of wind and energy, and Germany can produce or deliver the green tech to be able to, for these en, uh, uh, resources to be basically transformed into a commodity that can be consumed locally or exported. So yeah, yes, I'm sorry, I should have been clearer. Thank you so much, Daniela. This has been truly amazing.